Welcome. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's installment of Letting Library Lecture Series, hosted by Milwaukee Historical Society, City of Milwaukee, Letting Library, Willamette Falls Studio, and Facebook group Milwaukee Chit Chat for, nights to the, for tonight's program entitled Celebration of Black Excellence. Tonight we have two special voices in the Black community, Social Justice Leader and North Clackamas School Board Chair Libra Ford, and City of Milwaukee's newest elected counselor, Desi Nicodemus. Tonight we'll explore relatable experiences of how our guests have been treated because of the color of their skin, not only in Oregon, but where they grew up and their experiences throughout the world. We will discuss their political wins and accomplishments and explore why they ran, what does it mean for our community, and what enhancements they are striving towards. We will examine what it means to bring together communities and creating unity by seeking their advice of why it is important to be involved and accomplish goals inside our community. If you are viewing this program on Zoom, please feel free to use the chat feature to ask our guest questions during the discussion. The host will determine the questions and because of time constraints, we'll read about three or four at the end of each topic. We will present the questions at the end of each segment. I am the host for the evening, Greg Hemer, the Communications Director for Milwaukee Historical Society. Milwaukee Historical Society is the owner and operator of Milwaukee Museum, located at 3737 Southeast Adams Street, currently closed because of coronavirus. Yes, it is that building you have been driving by for 15 years on the corner of 37th and Railroad, but have failed to ever go in. We urge you to stop by and see the wonderful collection of artifacts and historical stories about our shared Milwaukee history. Milwaukee Historical Society started off in 1936 as pioneer children joined together to remember their parents' history. They started off as a social club, having picnics and meetings. In 1975, thanks to Chris and McDonald's efforts, Milwaukee Historical Society obtained Milwaukee Museum. It houses valuable artifacts of Milwaukee's past and has the world's largest research library dedicated to the history of Milwaukee. In 2012, the younger generation took over and we are striving to preserve Milwaukee's history for future generations. If you have not been to the museum lately, you will notice we changed it from a house museum to an interpretive center where all can come and visit admission free. We join in public events expressing our knowledge of Milwaukee history to the general public. We also engage the public in fun events and tours to inspire residents to learn more about their community. Today, Milwaukee Historical Society has over 120 members, 1,200 followers on Facebook, active on Twitter and Instagram, and we write a history article for the pilot every month. Milwaukee Museum houses the world's largest collection of artifacts, photographs, and documents about Milwaukee, Oregon. Our collection has countless artifacts related to the past, and our Claire Cooper Research Library has countless documents and photos of the days gone by. Soon, Arnawald Adventures, an interactive walk around Arnawald neighborhood, will be available on our website. Just like Lot's Loop, it features stories at certain stops that you can find by using your mobile device. Milwaukee Museum and Milwaukee Historical Society have survived and will continue to strive despite the challenges of 2020. We have been devastated by COVID-19 because we rely on income from donations. Expensive facilities and ongoing operations does not stop because of lack of usage. As we all know, the bills keep coming. Milwaukee Museum runs totally on donations and membership. It only costs $20 for an annual individual membership or $100 for an annual organization membership. Visit our website to see the benefits of membership and how easy it is to join. Your contribution will ensure Milwaukee Museum is open, a mission free for all those who want to visit, removing barriers of income e equality. Milwaukee, Muse Milwaukee Museum also strives to be inclusive with events and exhibits preserving and representing all histories of people and places, regardless of race, gender, religion, or ethnicity. This year, the, li the library lecture series is recording our shared history from 20 and 21. Our focus will be pr to preserve the importance of this historical year. First, our Black Excellence Program tonight, then in March, Women's Excellence, June, an interview with former Governor Roberts, 
and in October, interviews of us and how we felt during the COVID pandemic. Not only are these programs designed to capture the historic year, but are also designed to enhance our perceptions about our world and create empathies for others' perceptions. So let's begin by defining perception and empathy. Perception. Your image of the world is based on your perceptions, how you're raised, your experiences in life, your observations, your concepts, your consciousness. Your perception is neither right or wrong, but a world is seen by you as best fit for your desires, needs, and stability. Empathy is the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and envisioning the feelings, thoughts, and experiences of another. Tonight, we will hear about the perception of the world according to Chair Ford and Counselor Nicodemus and heightened empathy towards their perceptions of being a Black American. Let us first introduce our guests. Chair Ford, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Greg. Thank you for having me. My name is Libra Ford, and yeah, I'm the chair of the North Clackamas School Board this year. I also am the chief operating officer for an agency called Self Enhancement Incorporated for the Portland metro area. And I love children and children advocacy. Um, someone advocated for me, and so I feel like it is my duty to advocate for them. Councillor Nicodemus, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Good evening, Greg. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm Desi Nicodemus. <clears throat> I'm a fifth grade teacher in North Clackamas at Lot Wickham, and I'm newly elected to Milwaukee City Council. Uh, I too, <laughs> I think I've been teaching now for 21 or 22 years, so uh, I've been working with kids for a long time as well. And um, yeah, thank you for having us tonight. Thank you guys very much for joining us. And before we start our program, I'd like to tell you about the Letting Library. One of our great sponsors we have this evening is Letting Library. The new Letting Library had a soft opening January 7th, celebrated its grand opening on January 11th. In those first five days, the community embraced their new library with over 5,600 people coming through the doors, checking out over 11,000 items. Then COVID-19 hit, affecting all aspects of life throughout the country, and the Letting Library closed its doors to the public on March 15th. Throughout this pandemic, the library staff has provided services to its patrons in different ways, from making it possible to pick up library materials to offering programs online. Programs online, weekly story time videos, weekly read to the dog program, online homeschool challenges, three book clubs for adults, new, new databases like Creative Bug and Book Flicks, added daily access to the New York Times, help out with book requests, and the Letting Library Lecture Series. By mail, you can still uh, work with the library through Book Buddies, which is a book group for ages seven to nine and new card applications. Now you can still show up outside the library and they have curbside pickup for library items, including library of things, and a weekly grab and go story time craft bags for toddlers and preschoolers and school age kids. They also work, been working with outreach. They gave free books to several community partners to distribute to their families, including Healthy Start, Ready, Set, Go programs at Wichita Center and Bill Quist, North Clackamas School Care Program and Town Center Courtyard, Housing for Families in Recovery, among others. They handed out free books, curbside at all Milwaukee area free summer meal sites at the grammar schools, Arnold, Linwood, Wickham, Oak Grove, and at Milwaukee High School and Alder Creek Middle School. We will also, the Letting Library would like to give a big shout out to their friends of Letting Library have continued to support their efforts throughout the pandemic, making it possible to offer free books to our community par partners. Become a member of the Friends of Lending Library today. So our first uh, 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 topic tonight 
is going to kind of be discussing the uh, black experience. And so uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of mine. So I, I lived my childhood near Chicago, right? The land of Lincoln. Uh, we had integrated schools, some bust in students. I don't know if that's still a proper term, but that's the way we always said it. Bust in uh, students of color and some that lived in the, the neighborhood. Being around friends with and interaction with black students was typically normal. I never really thought about how my friends or other students of color ever really uh, thought, nor was it ever discussed about race or inequality. Uh, counselor, you are from Toledo and chair, uh, you are from Book Brooklyn, then to California. What were some of your experiences growing up? Desi, I yield to you. <laughs> I yield my time. I yield my time. Uh, so, growing up in Toledo, Toledo was about uh, you know sixty percent uh, white, thirty percent black. So it was pretty like it, it. It was pretty diverse. We also had a large Lebanese population uh, in Toledo. So you know, growing up, in most of the schools I went to, you know. Uh, actually, what I show my fifth graders is my fifth grade class picture. And actually, it's harder. You can count. It's easier to count how many white kids are in my class than it is the black kids in my class. So, you know, my, my school was probably, I'd say, if I think about it now, 80 percent, 90 percent black. Uh, I had black teachers growing up, black principals growing up. Uh, and as I got older, um, you know, being biracial, being mixed, even though like my mom's white, my dad's black, I, I identify as black. But when you're growing up in the 70s, you know, and I'm dating myself because, you know, I was born in 73. So like in school in the 70s and 80s, there weren't a whole lot of us like light brown kids. And that 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 kind of, that was difficult at times because you know, sometimes from the black community, we weren't black enough, you know, and then from the white community, we were safe, you know, and so like, I would have kids tell me, oh, it's okay for you to come to my house, but I can't have so and so come to my house because, you know, and at the time, you don't realize that that's a microaggression, you just think to yourself, wow, that's, that's weird. Why would you say something like that to me? And so, you know, growing up, it was harder. It, it, it was a little bit harder to navigate that space. And when I look at, I, when I look at our society now, and I, you know, in, even in my classroom, I see how many biracial kids there are. You know, it, it's really, it's really great uh, because they're not gonna. They they are gonna have some experiences, or um, you know they're going to go through some of the same things, but they're going to have more of them. You know, they're going to be more brown, more black kids that they can have a shared experience with as opposed to, you know, myself and my brother. And then I think there was, there was another kid. His mom was the biology teacher at my high school and his three brothers. And, you know, so it was like the two of us at our high school and, you know, the two mixed kids, and then everyone else, and not everyone else, but you know what I mean. And so growing up there was, it was a good experience. And there's always a reason why people are from Ohio, because you don't want to stay in Ohio. But you know, that, that's just a little bit of, of me growing up in Toledo. Chair, I yield to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, first I want to say I'm just so excited that um, Desi is our new counselor in um, Milwaukee. Super proud of you, man, um, and excited to have you in that seat. Um, my experience, I grew up in New York City, Harlem, New York, and, um, and my parents were from Atlantic City, uh, Jersey, and my mom was from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And New York is a different bird. Um, my class was everything. It wasn't necessarily any one thing. Uh, I look at my class pictures and I can literally see the globe in my picture. So it was very different for me growing up because it wasn't a discussion of difference. 
as a negative thing, it was fortification that you were different and we were all different and we all lived together and we were all dope. Like that was just the way I grew up in New York and New York has a very, um, underlying arrogance about difference, right? Like difference is, is what makes the city move. And so I was fortified by that as a youth. And then I had two activist parents who um, came from different circumstances, right? So they're very aware that what I was experiencing wasn't necessarily the world, right? Um, so they were very conscious of teaching me what the world may say or do. So I always felt pretty prepared. Um, and then I, when I got to college was the first time that I realized, oh, there, there's, there's issues in a world with my skin color. Some of what Desi was saying really resonates with me because I'm not necessarily a brown skin girl. I'm considered like caramel. I'm not like light skin, but I'm not dark skin either. So I was somewhere in between. But the colorism in the black community is really complex. Right. But where I sit um, was more acceptable, I guess. And so some of the things that some of my brown skin friends were experiencing was a little different than me. Um, and in college, it became more prominent. The colorism was really deep. I went to a Jewish college and I was the only, like I was the first black girl on the basketball team and it was very different. Um, but even in that experience, it wasn't extreme for me because the Jewish and black community based on my education with my mother and my father's advocacy were always united in a lot of fights. And so that's, that was my experience with the Jewish community. And so that wasn't really completely different for me, but it was di more different than New York. When I came to Oregon with my chocolate babies, I have chocolate babies, right? And um, that was when I realized, oh, this is different. Because we moved here from Hawaii and Hawaii is mostly brown people. And that's all we knew, right? That's all they knew. And I was coming from my experience and it was, it was what it was. And I got here and I realized, oh, this is what my parents were talking about. But it took me 40 plus years to experience it and I think consciously I lived in places that didn't expose me to certain things because as a New Yorker, you just don't go there, right? You're like, I don't go to those places because they don't get it. And so I don't go. So coming here was my first like true experience where I not only had to defend myself, but I defend my kids. And I, and all the stories my grandparents talked about became their story. And I was devastated that that was now our reality. So, okay. so that's a, that's an interesting. So we have this topic about how Oregon feels, especially with the black experience. And so, uh, from uh, my perspective, right, uh, it, I find Oregon very weird. It's very segmented, it, and there's lots of reasons for it. You know, the history of Oregon. For those who don't know, um, it was entered in as a free state, but didn't allow any blacks to own any land. Uh, and then in World War II, they needed labor. Uh, so they brought a lot of blacks in, uh, but they only kept them down in the Vanport area and they weren't allowed to buy houses any, anywhere. And, and, you know, the, uh, the Hadleys shared their experience when they went to go out and go buy their first house, which would have been, uh, you know, the uh, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, nobody would give a black person a loan for a house, right? They had to go find somebody that would uh, be a, a white person that would basically kind of sell it to them, you know, on what we call contract. And so... Um, am I alone in this feeling about Oregon or, or is it just the way that it is? I, I, I uh, maybe you guys can shed some light on why it is that way or. Yeah, the why is difficult. <laughs> I mean, I think for me, I will speak from my opinion and it's not necessarily any facts. But my opinion is that when you have a history that was a, a state that was built to not have any others, it was supposed to be a white utopia, and all systems were built to make that a reality, then you come forward to 2021, it's very difficult to see, it's, it's not difficult to see why we feel the way we feel. 
Um, a lot of people want to ignore the pieces of that history because they think because it's history, thus it should not be, it, we don't do that now. And But when you look at the history, it's taken so long for a lot of those very important lines that were drawn in the sand to be removed. And so even though they were moved on paper and the mind was saying we signed it away, many of the hearts did not believe that. And and so there has to be a connection between mind and heart in order for people to feel like they actually are welcome. And so for me, that is my, I guess, opinion on the why. I don't believe all Oregonians or all people that live here who understand the root of the why of Oregon have truly co connected their heart to why we need all people to be here. Okay, that's hard to follow. <laughs> I'm gonna lie. Uh, I, I I didn't realize until uh, you know I used so my wife and I taught overseas for you know a chunk of time, and the only time we would come to Oregon is in the summertime. So we would spend time in my wife's old neighborhood, which is um, over by 82nd and or 82nd Avenue and Powell. And so when I would go over there, it was pretty diverse. Like, you know, they had Fubon, I believe. So I would spend my time over there. And it wasn't until we moved back in 2015 that I was like, whoa. And I, I've heard, I'd heard from people that Oregon's really white. And they're like, why are you moving there? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Whenever I go there, I see, I see brown people. I see all kinds of people. Then when I moved here, I was like, whoa okay, now I see what they're talking about because it, it's a, it's extremely white. And then, you know, like, once again, like looking for a job, I was like trying to look for schools that were just as diverse as the ones that I went to. And to explain the why about why Oregon is, I mean, I would have to uh, agree with what Libra said. Um, I think something, another thing that was really eye-opening to me is I took the... Um, uh, the fair housing bus tour and really got an in-depth history of Oregon and their deep racist roots, you know, where the governor used to be, you know, openly in the Klan. And, you know, then I just think, oh my God, I'm living in this place. that's like a white utopia. And so it was, it, it, it took a little time for me to get used to it moving here as opposed to just visiting. Um, but yeah, as far as the why, I mean, you know, who knows why? I mean, I know why white people do what they do is because they, they don't look at, they like to the other people, not all white people. I, I, I take that back, but you, you know what I mean? And so it's just, this this country was built on the backs of black and brown people. And so there's a, you know, the, for some reason to dehumanize us is something that is ingrained in some folks. So I, you know, I would have to, like I said, <laughs> Libra was a lot more uh, eloquent <laughs> in explaining the why. But, uh, you know, and also I, I just wanted to talk one more thing about my uh, growing up. My mom was raising two black boys in Toledo, Ohio, and my mom's passed away now, but we she raised us in the black community. And now looking back on it, I so want to ask her, did were you did you do that on purpose or were those just your people? You know, you just hung out with them because you know, we went to the black barber. You know, we went we went to the the barbecue place that had the thick you know, the thick glass where they had to turn, you know, you put your order in. I mean, we, we grew up in the neighborhood and I, I just, so I just wish that she was alive today. So I could just be like, was that intentional or was it, you know, just your people? So I, or I just was it, to... was it her being an excellent mother? Yeah. <laughs> You're, uh, yep. Yep. She knew what so, you needed. Yep. Lieber, cor correct me when I'm wrong, right? When you came in and you said, hey, I'm going to buy a house in Oregon, right? Didn't 
didn't some of uh, uh, your friends basically say, well, you need to uh, write, or you're going to go move to North Portland, right? Or uh, instead of Happy Valley, or am I telling that story completely wrong? Well, not completely wrong. It's kind of right. So I came here because I used to work for a company where Oregon was one of my regions. And so I would come back and forth. The office was actually on 7th and Holiday, right across from the Lloyd Center. I would come into, uh, for a year, I came here every two weeks and I would fly in, go to work, stay at that double tree right there and fly back to Hawaii. And then I had to move because my company was like, so we're not going to pay for this forever. Take your behind to Oregon, <laughs> where your office is. Um, so when I moved here, I looked at, I was already working with school districts. So I was looking at a school district for my kids. I had a, uh, at that time a ninth grader and I knew she needed to graduate. And uh, so North Clackamas school district was a school district of my choice. And so in picking that school district, I had to pick her high school and then I picked a home. Then while I was here, I was recruited by SEI. And so when I started working for SEI, which if you guys don't know, is an agency that focuses on black youth and families, they would say to me, how did you get to Damascus? Like, Black people don't live in Damascus, right? And I would say, well, I chose it for my kids' education. And that concept was one that I realized was a freedom concept, right? It wasn't a concept based on all the things that I normally, as a Black person, would think about. But I had come here to educate my kids, and I was not thinking about the boundaries or where Black people were or weren't or any of those things. I needed to educate my kids, and I wanted them to have the best experience. But in that moment when they said that Black people don't live there, I realized that I had a moment of one privilege and a moment of clarity, right, where I was free, for even if it was just a moment. Now, when I got here, I realized, oh, God, what did I do? But that moment of having that ability to be free enough to make that choice just based on what I think is best for my kids was amazing. Um, and I wish that for all people, to be honest with you. So the, the last segment of this topic is, is that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I've traveled around the world. And, uh, you know, as a, as a white American, you know, they basically see me as tourist dollars. So I, I recognize that fact. And, you know, I've always had good experiences. And every time that I go travel, I try to find a local, uh, either a taxi cab uh, guy or gal, well, mostly guy, but a uh, taxi cab person or somebody at the hotel or something like that uh, to get me, you know, where's the good local places to go eat and go visit. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the only real issues I had over when I've traveled outside the United States is, uh, is non-American tourists coming up to me and wanting to talk American politics, right? Uh, now, both you guys have uh, visited and uh, Councillor uh, Nicodemus, you, you have, uh, uh, of course, uh, taught in other countries. And I know, Libra, you've uh, uh, traveled all, have traveled all over the world. Is your experience the same or is it different? Uh, is it different because of the uh, do people treat you different because of the color of your skin? You know, it it, it depends. So uh, I, I've I've lived in Turkey for six years. I lived in China for two years, and Brazil for one. And I, actually, the my experience in Brazil was really uh, outside of. Salvador Bahia being extremely poor, it's extremely black because it, it used to be the capital of Brazil. So there was a lot of like, you could go to the town and still see where they did the slave trade. They have the chains and, and everything, but I'll never forget driving in from the airport and I'm looking at the beach and I just saw nothing but black people surfing. And like being from Ohio, you know, and watching TV, the only time you ever see black people, you know, you never see black people surfing. It's like, it's Hawaiians or white people, right? And I was just like, I'm, oh, what? Look, look at all these black people surfing. And so like being in, in Brazil with all those Afro-Brazilians was, it was great because everybody, you know, they look at me and I, I look Brazilian. They, you know, they come up to me and they start speaking Portuguese. Turkey was actually the same way. Like in Turkey is where it's situated uh, on the globe, 
you have Turks that look Asian. You have Turks that look uh, European white. You have Turks that look like me. So a lot of the time, you know, Turks just thought I was Turkish. And that, you know, I, I can't, t I have countless Turks that I worked with that say, you look like my cousin. You look like my cousin. I have black people that say that you look like my cousin. So it was great in Turkey. I think the place where I experienced it the most, uh, which was really difficult was in China, you know, like being, and, and, and that doesn't just go for me. Uh, even my wife experienced, she, she was called white devil. You know, I was, I was either Charles Barkley, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, one guy, one, we were in Shanghai. I'll never forget. We're walking down the pedestrian walkway and this guy jumps in front of me and he's just like King Kong. And I, you know, it was like, you know, I look at my wife and I'm like, oh, I feel the rage, you know, but, I, you know, you just got to, you know, they're ignorant people no matter where you go. Right. And so, um, you know, my, my experiences in Turkey and Brazil were fantastic. I There was one, I, you know, the, I think the scariest time I've ever had was I was in Austria, you know, you know, backpacking like white people do. Hey, I'm going to go backpacking across Europe. And I... I met these folks who I thought were really nice. They take me into the, they, they're like, come hang out with us. They take me into this bar, I go with them. And uh, the guy's sister was just like, you need to get out of here. And I'm like, why? And I thought it was really weird because when I walked in, it was literally like the record scratched and everybody watched me. And she, she then proceeds to tell me that they like to beat up black people. So I quickly exit the bar and I, I like, run, I start walking and then I see the entire bar empty out and they start walking and then I start running. So needless to say, I'll never go back to Austria. I mean, that's some place that, you know, I won't go cause I don't ski and I don't need to go there. But, you know, in general, for the most part, you know, like I said, in my two experiences, my experiences in Turkey and Brazil were great as opposed to, you know, China, which you know, we were in mainland China as opposed to going to like Hong Kong because Hong Kong is a really international city. I, I mean, I, I would imagine Hong Kong is a lot like um, New York in that kind of way where you have all kinds of folks from all over the world because it's an international business uh, hub. But, you know, if I, if I ever had a choice, I am going to buy some retirement home in Turkey in the, on the beach. If you ever get a chance to go to Turkey, go to Turkey, black, white, brown, you'll have a great time. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and once again, you know, people are, people are this, you're going to have ignorant folks no matter where you go. So that, that's kind of my experience and I'll yield my time. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm going to play this up all night now. I'm going to yield my time to chair for it. I love it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to pay attention to two things. Our fire alarm went off earlier. So I'm like, what's going on? But anyway, um, yeah, in my travels, I would say I've had better treatment in other countries than I've had in America. Um, and it's interesting because I think it's twofold for me. One, my brown skin in certain countries is just different. You know, they just don't see it. But more, I think more obvious for most folks is my height. So like Asian countries, for example, um, every place I've gone, it becomes a, like a, a spectacle, right? Like cameras out, they're taking pictures and it's not necessarily my skin. It's just like, oh my God, she's six, five and it's a smaller country. Right. So I'm towering over everyone. So that's where I find where most of my attention goes, even in some of the other countries. But I would say my last trip was to Korea and yeah, I got off the plane and it was like, you would think I was some household name, like cameras were just going and they were standing next to me and rallying around me. And I was just like, I'm tired. I've been on the plane forever. I just leave me alone, you know? Um, but still very, um, cordial. I never, I never felt any, um, there was no malice behind it. It was just, wow, she's really tall. Um, so that's been more my travel experience. Well, I bet you your Facebook posts reach all the way out to Korea, so that's probably why they were, uh, they were coming for you. 
So we finished up the segment, and I'm going to uh, check out the chat and see what kind of questions we have. Bear with me. Well, we don't necessarily have any questions, but we, we do have a, a, a comment that um, that somebody sent in that uh, uh, basically uh, the experience was the, the same for them, that, that they were white and they moved to Oregon 20 years ago from San Francisco Bay. And uh, the first day that they got there, their kids said to them, Mom, everybody is so white here. I, I find that I, I, I find that too. I mean, uh, am I right? I grew up around the Chicago area, then out in Colorado In Colorado, there aren't very many black folks, but there certainly are a lot of uh, Latinos and it's a 50, 50 mix and nobody really minds each other. Uh, meaning that they, they don't care what the color of their skins are. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you move out here and it, it does, I mean, it, 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 it is, it's odd for me or it feels odd. Um, and especially with, um, so let me ask this question that what well, as long as we have time for questions, um, you know, the Hanley's bring up this thing. Oh, my neighborhood is going away, right? My black community is going away. And part of it is the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, that generation is getting older. They're moving out to different places. Uh, they're selling their houses. Their houses are, uh, on a scale from let's say happy Valley, right? Relatively affordable for young families. Um, and, and also, you know, the buildup that they put into that neighborhood, uh, some of, you know, the, the term that has been used is, uh, gentrification. Um, uh, so I guess my, my question to you guys, do you guys find that uh, out? I know you're transplants and so you didn't really kind of grow up here, but, um, uh, do you expect kind of to see more of the, the spreading or the, uh, non-segmentation of the uh uh of the population kind of spreading out um i it's interesting to hear people talk about the changes of course gentrification as a system and as a construct is problematic right so i don't i don't want to dismiss any of that and the things that have been allowed in that um, construct are harmful and there's nothing about that should that anyone should have to experience. I think as time has gone on between planes, trains, and automobiles and this kind of this plurality that I think a lot of people of color have felt in the fact that they don't feel like they have to live somewhere in particular, there's this element of freedom that I think comes with the younger generation and it started way before my generation, right? Like my mother grew up in one place, but she moved to New York City. And so the migration of individuals has, uh, has been kind of an evolution over time that I think has dispersed groups. But in that, I, when I listen to Black people say to me, oh, my people are moved, I acknowledge the fact that systems have a big part of it, but some of it is this, this feeling of... Um, I'm losing my, my support system in my place, right? Like in place for us, even when redlining was a thing and redlining is not just a thing in Oregon, it's a thing in a lot of states. When redlining was a thing, it was a place, right? And we took the, the scraps of the place and we made it ours. And so that place-based foundation became comfort. It became home and became where we belong, even though we may have worked outside of it and no longer was there. So I think the question becomes, how do we as people of color create place-based opportunities that still make us feel grounded in who we are as a people, but still allow us the freedom to live where we want to live. And that is a dynamic that we still haven't figured out. And I think emotionally people express it in things like my people don't live here anymore. For, for me, since I've moved around so much, I, I always look at it as I have to go out and find and make my community, you know, like meeting people because, you know, I have a son, he's five, you know, he presents his white, but he's still a chocolate baby. Right. 
And I need to be just as intentional and a good father to make sure that he's around folks that look like me, folks that look like him, families that look like his. And, and so, you know, moving here, you know, I had no idea what Milwaukee, Oregon was. You know, the only Milwaukee I knew was, you know, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, right? And so, you know, coming here and, you know, I'd be in my yard if I see a black person come by, I'd be, you know, I'm like that dog. Like, hey, 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 can we be friends? Can we be friends? And so, you know, and, and, and I've had the luxury of, uh, doing a job in North Clackamas with helping to recruit and retain teachers of color that I've, I've been able to network and meet other black educators and then therefore, you know, expand my circle of black folks, brown folks, and then bring them in. So, you know, I've never really had like a set community since, you know, I moved away from Toledo, Ohio. It's always just been us or me. And so, you know, the, the community that I look at is, the community that I make for, you know, my family and everyone else, because there are, there, you know, there are quite a few black folks that have moved here, moved to Oregon, and they experience the same thing. So then, you know, I have a buddy, he, he moved to Milwaukee, Oregon, and, you know, I got another buddy that lives in West Lynn, and we all try and, we all try and get together, and we all try and, like, hang out so we can, you know, be that support system for each other because that's what it boils down to, right? Is like having that support and being able to say, hey, this is what I experienced today and just just be able to let, you know, just be yourself. Cause you know, sometimes we have to code switch in our, you know, in our life. And we just can't, we just can't be ourselves. And unfortunately that, you know, I wish it wasn't that way, but that's the way it is. And so, you know, it's it's all about surrounding yourself with the community that you need and you want. Thank you. And so before we move on to our next segment, we're going to uh, talk about one of our great sponsors, the City of Milwaukee. The City of Milwaukee invites you to contribute your ideas and ask questions about projects at a time that works best for you on the new Engage Milwaukee platform. Visit engagemilwaukeeoregon.gov to learn about this new way to engage online. I have joined, and there are a variety of topics to discuss. Uh, sorry, I went blank. Am I there? Uh, there are a variety of topics to discuss. With discussion boards, surveys, and other fun interactive items, this is a great way to share your opinion about upcoming projects, improvements, and designs. Not only does it help make decisions for our great city and an easy way to be involved, it is also fun. Sorry, my, my screen went a little blank on me there real quick, so I got a little nervous. So let's move on to the next topic, uh, political wins and accomplishments. So congratulations to both of you. Winning an election is never easy, of course, and it takes real motivation and commitment to win a campaign, right? Chair Ford, you are the first black woman to chair North Clackamas School District. And Councilor Nicodemus, you are our first black city councilor of Milwaukee. So being the first makes you historical. You are gonna be a page in a book, right? I know you uh, are both, uh, I know you both, and I'm very happy that you are my representative. So the question is, why did you run and what were your motivations and platforms? Uh, so I never, ever thought about running for political office and, you know, I think it came about, well, so the, the work that I had been doing in North Clackamas kind of helped me meet some folks. And then Angel Falconer was just like, Desi, have you ever thought about running for office? And I'm like, I am a fifth grade teacher. The only people I wanted to deal with I'm taller than, and I could tell them to sit down and be quiet, and that's it. And then, you know, after the murder of George Floyd, um, things took like a drastic change, right? And then uh, black voices needed to be amplified. So there was the rally in Clackamas, and 
after the rally in Clackamas, I felt that the you know the black voices in Milwaukee needed to be heard. So then you know with the help of community folks here in Milwaukee, we organized the you know the Black Lives Matter Sit in Solidarity event. And then I was approached again about running for city council. And I was just looking through my text messages. And on June 24th, I had texted Libra and said, hey, I've been approached about running for city council. What do you think? You don't need to reply right now. And she's like, her response was, what's the hesitation? <laughs> and I was like, OK, all right. And you know, I never really, from there, it just started to gain momentum. You know, I had to talk to my wife and, you know, I, I think now more than ever, uh, I think about uh, John Lewis's quote, if not us, then who, um, if not, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, if not now, then when? So, you know, I think at that point, I had the momentum, but I, you know, once again, I didn't know if people would vote for me. You know, I'm just some Yahoo who just moved to, moved to Oregon. I'm teaching fifth grade. I lived here. I lived there. Like nobody's really going to vote for me. I really don't have, you know, I'm not into politics. I'm just an, I'm just a dude, right? I just, I just want to watch Michigan football when that's it, you know, and like spend time with my, that's not all. My wife is giving me a look right now. Like that's all you want to do. <laughs> No, it's not all I wanted. I'm just, so anyway, uh, some folks approached me. They were like, hey, we'd like to help out with your campaign. You know, we'd really like to get behind you. And they were, I mean, it was a good group of people. And so I said, all right, let's do it. And it was just amazing how Milwaukeeans stepped up. I mean, just from them turning out to the sit-in event to showing up to vote for me. I mean, it really says a lot that people in Milwaukee are ready for change and want to change. And I'm hoping by doing this, I, I'm not, I don't want to inspire the next Desi. I want to inspire the first whoever. I want somebody, I want somebody to come and take my position. You know, I want another, another BIPOC community member to say, I'm running against you. I want your job. Because really, that's what I want, right? I want... I want them to take my job. I want them to take Mayor Gamba. You know, I want I want them to see that if I can do it, they can do it. Anybody can do it. You just have to, you know, in the end, you have to believe in yourself and you have to have a good support group, a support system around you to help you through all, all of it. Because it the barriers for for running for public office are gigantic, especially for black folks, black and brown folks. I never, you know, I, I called them hoops and then somebody said, oh, you know, those are barriers. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Those are barriers. Those are straight up barriers. I mean, this the system is set up for old white men to continue in their job. I mean, look at what's happening you know, in Congress, you know, you get the let's let's keep America great. Really, what that's saying is let's keep America white. And that's not the way that we're going. So I, I did it because I want somebody I want some young person to say I want I want his job on city council. And I say, bring it. Yeah, you can take it. I mean, you know, you, you know, figuratively. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they could take it eventually. <laughs> uh, um, why did I run? So I've always had an objective to be involved in change since I was in school. My father, you know, anytime he was called to the office, he's like, what was she fighting for? Who was she fighting for? And because it was never for me, right? It was always like somebody who was mistreated and I was like enough's enough I'm taking control of this get out their face so my dad would show up every time and be like okay who is she fighting for and they were like yeah you know she's justice that's that was my nickname so I always had a justice mind and a, a real desire for um the voiceless to to find their voice uh when I was really young my grandfather told me that I wasn't six five um to play basketball. And he was like, I'm not trying to offend you. 
but you're six five to be heard and you have to figure out what you need to be heard about. And that takes time and that takes reflection and that takes you connecting to people around you. And I took that very seriously and I've never walked away from that. And so when I came here, I felt like there was a lot of voiceless people um, who felt um, despair, who felt like they couldn't be heard, like it was just a black hole that they couldn't climb out of. And I, I honestly didn't think I could um, be the change, but I knew that I could at least give them hope and find some way for us to start moving them out of where they felt they were just kind of in an abyss. So that's why I originally ran. Um, I stay because every time we kind of overcome a barrier, crash down a wall, I see more voices showing up that look different. Um, I see more conversation that sounds different. And so it, it, it sustains me and it, it tells me that, you know, we're doing the work that's important. If I could piggyback off of what Libra just said, it's a, for me, being a teacher, it's about giving our kids a voice, you know, and that's, I, I think that's what's, that's what really drives me is to make sure that, you know, the decisions that are being made now will affect our younger generation. And we need to make sure that our kids coming up now have the strength and the capacity and the willpower to step up and, and do what needs to be done. And so making sure that they have the opportunity to have their voices heard is really important because I, I, for me, that was a lot of the, the sit-in was having people hear the kids' experiences. Last night with uh, Angel uh, speaking, Angel Wilton from Round Middle School uh, singing that song at city council last night and to her talking about her experiences. That's what people need to hear. And that's what, that's what our, our, our future generation they need to be able to have the strength to know that they can do it. So that, that leads into a, a, a good question. So, uh, right, uh, Chair Ford, you've been on the uh, board for two years now, and, and uh, Councillor Nicodemus, you've been uh, on the job for about a month. So um, we all have plans, right? We all have vision. So what are, what are your goals or what do you want to see done by the time that uh, you leave uh, the position that you're in? Uh, for me, with the school district, I'd like to see us continue to advance the equity work that has already been um, a great movement towards, I think, some actions that are positive but I'd love to see us advance that even deeper. Um, and also um, I'd love to see more uh, representation on the board. I'd love to see us have some, some um, opposed races, honestly. I think that uh, the statistic of school board seats is 70% of them go unopposed in a race. And I, I love to see people find confidence in sharing their experiences. And I love what Desi said, you know, we want the, the person that's your neighbor that isn't the politician, right? We need that voice because your vision is crystal clear. And most of the time when people come to a seat and they didn't have intent of being a politician, their heart is pure. And so the way that they listen, the way that they see, the way that they even talk is from the purest place in their heart. And that's what we need for our kids. And so I hope that we get all of that. I hope we get everyone to stand up and be like, I want to, I want to sit in the seat. I, I would support anyone that would stand up and want to do that. My, my hope by the time uh, my time is done in city council is that there won't be any more, you're the first. It'll be, it'll be normal to have, you know, four BIPOC folks sitting on city council and there, there will be no more firsts and it'll just be, it's normal, you know, 
and it's it's hard. <laughs> I mean, just you know, I, I think being black is hard, and then running for public office is even harder because there are things that you know we just we don't know. We're not in the know, and you once again you have to surround yourself with people in the know. Um, being a teacher. Uh, I would love to see more black and brown teachers, uh, <laughs> but I also know that, you know, you can't be what you can't see, right? So if you don't see, you know, like Lieber said, it's all about representation. So if you don't see black city councilors, if you don't see black mayors, um, then you're going to, you're going to think that maybe I can't, I can't do that, but you can. You know, just like if I don't have black teachers, you know, I'm I'm not I don't want to be a teacher. So it's it's just making sure that kids see themselves in people that are in leadership around them, so they can then aspire. Not like I like I always say, it's not to aspire to be like me or or Libra. It's to be the next. Be you're gonna be you. You know, I think uh, I think what it was. Somebody said, I don't want to be the next Michael Jordan. You know, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be Steph Curry, right? Or I'm going to be Damian Lillard, you know? Like, yeah, it's nice to want to uh, aspire to be like that, but you want to be the, you want to be you. You need to be you and represent who you are. So I, I would love to go around and talk to more of our high schools here in North Clackamas and just talk to our black students, our black and brown students and tell them about this experience and be like, you can do what I did. You just need, you need to know the right people like Libra and myself. And then we, you know, and really that's what it's about. Cause that's, think about how all these white folks you know how they get to where they are. It's about who they know. Right. And when they're in that position of power, they just give it to the next person behind them. And we have to start doing that. Right. We have to start. We have to start guiding them and they can see more of us as chairs of a school board, a city councilor, a school principal, you know, so that's my hope. I am pausing because my wife is printing something uh, offline and it's coming through on the audio. So, uh, but we do have some questions from the audience and, and, and here's an interesting uh, question. Um, so uh, our region, right, it seems, uh, has become a little bit more um, divisionary, uh, right? Uh, and so uh, what can we as the community uh, help to support uh, your leadership and the leadership development of others who are willing to step up and more fully represent our North Clackamas County. Um, I so that's from Representative, and I first want to say I'm happy that she's here because I think she's awesome. Uh, but I also think that this is definitely an important question right now. We have uh, a very divisive kind of world that has so many complexities to it that I think everyone in it um, may not even understand how they contribute to the divisiveness, right? And some do. Some are intentional about it and some are it's unintentional um, harm. So I think the way that um, leadership can support is when, when we're sitting in seats, you're just really, really clear on where the divisiveness stands and where it's coming from and name it, right? In those moments and not wait for the moment to go away and then hope that you get another opportunity. Because in naming it, it may not fix it in that moment, but it does give everyone pause. And that pause to me, similar to COVID and the civil unrest we've been dealing with, that pause allows people's hearts to settle into an, an idea or a thought. Why do I feel this way? What's going on? And even if they exit fast and they don't acknowledge and they you know, unconsciously just 
remove themselves from that pause, there will be a few who will sit in it, who will rethink and who we will adjust. The adjustment may not be all that we need, but it will be some of what we need. And I'm a big proponent that in order for us to win in the life, in this life, there is like several different armies and the army that fights against systematic racism in those pauses, you gain new soldiers and those soldiers become a part of the army in the fight, right? So the next place that they sit, they'll cause a pause. And eventually the army's big enough where the divisiveness doesn't, it can't control anything. So I just think naming is important as a leader, sitting your seat firm and confident and knowing that if you are truly for equity, that you should wear a crown of confidence that says, I will pause this because this is harmful and I will make sure you acknowledge that before we move on. Yeah, I would, I would say too that listening to people, you know, like, there's always these things that we say in meetings, listening to understand and just like really listen to understand where somebody's coming from, because I feel people, they just want to be heard. And sometimes you, you have to give them an opportunity to be heard as well as, you know, like, you know, sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable for some folks and they're going to have to be able to live in that uncomfortableness to move forward, to be able to join that army. Right. They're going to have to, you're going to, other folks are going to have to make them feel uncomfortable. And it can't always be black or brown people to let them know that, hey, this isn't right. It's going to be, it's going to have to be another white person. And it's going to be a hard conversation. It's going to be difficult, but that's okay because then you sit, you listen, like, like Libra was saying, they're going to, they're going to take that pause. They're going to hear, and you're not going to get everyone, right? And it, it, it's going to take time, but it's just making sure that people are heard and at times making them sit in their uncomfortableness to move forward. So kind of while we're on the set, we're, <clears throat> we're going to talk in, uh, about the sit-in uh, for solidarity in our, in our, in our next uh, segment, but I think maybe this is the right time to ask this question. So, the question is, Is do you sense any shifts in Milwaukee after a season of high, pro, uh, high profile demonstrations and rallies? I think that's more maybe localized to maybe even Portland or, or national. And, and if so, uh, uh, what do you see and do you see it lasting or growing in a positive way? Uh, I in Milwaukee, uh, I've definitely seen a shift for the in the in the positive. Like I, I will, I'll never forget election day. I'm going out to my car to get something. Somebody walks by and says, "Good luck, Desi." And I was like, "Who are you?" <laughs> Thanks. And another day, we were walking. My wife, my family, and I were walking, and somebody walked by and said, "I voted for you." You know, and that that made you know like. Once again, you know, who am I? You know, and and I, I felt, I feel like folks in Milwaukee were ready for a change. They needed it. They needed somebody to come along. But I, you know, I don't ever like to, I, I'm not that person. I'm just, once again, I'm a fifth grade teacher that did one thing and it turned into this and folks in Milwaukee were ready. I think, you know, Milwaukee's different than Portland. Uh, it's its own, you know, obviously it's its own city, but we have our own thing here. And the one thing that I've noticed is that, like, I've seen it improve for the better for Black black folks here. I mean, like I said, people, <laughs> people talk to me and I, my wife will be like, do you know them? And I'm like, no, do you? <laughs> And so it, it, it's really moved forward. But, you know, once again, we still have a long way to go. It's not, you know, it's a marathon, right? Not a sprint. And, you know, the more people that are talking to each other and just, you know, saying, hey, why do you feel this way? Well, let's talk about it is going to get, is going to make a bigger shift. And it's going to be the white folks 
who are going to help other white folks make that shift, right? Because it's going to be that 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 son who's sitting down at dinner with their parents who might think one way and just talking to them, and then that shift might come then. But it might not come then. It might come, you know, a couple of weeks later. It's it's just, have once again, it's having that conversation and and trying to... I don't ever want to say like you want to forcibly shift someone's thinking. It's just talking to them and listening to how they're feeling and what they're thinking to get them to make that shift. And and I've seen it here in Milwaukee. Um, other folks, you know, I, I've I've seen it. Other folks might disagree. And once again, that's that's straight up. That's okay, right? Because I'm just me, and I can only speak from my experience. Yeah, so um, thank you for the question. I definitely, I know the individual that asked this question, so I know how deep, what a deep thinker he is. Um, I think the high profile demonstrations are always um, happening in the world of people of color. It happens in different ways. It happens in different structures. Um, in particular, we saw you know, sit-ins and protests that were the current version of that being the profile that the media wanted to show. But I, I wanna recognize that rallies and demonstrations happen when you have a DESI sitting on city council. I mean, that's a form of a protest or a rally or a demonstration of what can be. Um, of course, sometimes you get larger uh, communions of people that, you know, create uh, obviously attention in, in media and social media that we then, you know, name and title and all those good things. But Lorraine Hansberry, who is a wonderful um, writer, um, Raising in the Sun, she's got all types of stuff that she's done. She explains it really well in terms of demonstrations and rallies. And she was a thinker, right? She was an activist and a very deep thinker. And she talks about the fact that when you have these high profile demonstrations and protests, the doors open, and then you have all of a sudden this, this influx of, of people of color who are allowed in. And then when the profiling stops, the doors shut. Um, and there's this, there's this cycle in history that happens over time. So these particular protests of Black Lives Matter have opened up doors where we now see things like more diversity and equity inclusion officers are now being hired in, eight, in different companies. And you have all these new things or not new things, but things that are now being emphasized as the doors are open. And then unfortunately, I think we're coming to a point where the doors are shutting again. Depending on how you look at it, it can be negative or positive. To me, everything counts. There's nothing that doesn't matter and count. And so if that door is open and we get more of something, it counts because there's more space being taken up by different types of voices. And that is a win. Now, when it shuts on people, it doesn't feel good. And that's the part of our system that we have to fix. How do we get rid of the doors? How do we get rid of the walls so people can freely move in and out of these areas as they see fit, as they see a need versus the control still being the system saying the door is open or it's closed? That is the institutional racism that is a problem in our country. It is cool to say that you love to see the demonstrations and so thus you hired a DEI person. That's really cool to say, but it'd be even cooler to say that I don't need a DEI person because I've already been doing it. I don't need to prove to you that this is a moment for me. That's what we have to get. And so uh, uh, I'm going to follow up uh, with this uh, question. I mean, uh, let's uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, of course, uh, uh, gave uh, some rise to be able to, to right, conduct these rallies. Let's be honest. We're all a little shut in. We're all a little crazy. We all want something to do. Right. Um, and but. But really, I mean, you know, you think back way back to Ferguson and uh, even uh, 
you know, Rodney King, you know, even after the Rodney King uh, uh, events, you know, there wasn't a real big push, uh, you know, for uh, liberties again, not like there was in the 60s, I guess. And so, um, you know, there's been the slow uh, rising and organizing. And so why why this time? I mean, what 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 is the time that why why did this come to this point uh, right now? I, I, I don't expect you guys to speak for every organization in the world, but uh, maybe your feelings towards it. You want me to go? You're looking at me. <laughs> So I, I actually, you know, most of you guys know that I'm a thinker and it's so interesting because so much of my childhood thinking was a great thing. I had parents that fortified it and then like 20s, you, you start meeting the wrong people and they tell you it's a bad thing. And so now, you know, in my 40s, it's, I don't really care. It's, it works for me, but I'm a deep thinker. And in my thinking, I mean, I talked to my mom a lot, who's an activist from the 60s, right? And, you know, it's always this comparison in the conversation, right? Like, that's not how we did it. And it's just, it, you know, she wants to tell me all the things that, um, all the things they did and why they did it and, you know, all the messy parts of it now. And it's two things that I want to say to your question. One, it's interesting when I talked to my mom and when my father was alive, it was the same thing. They talk to me like the civil rights movement was like day one, they got really mad. Day two, they organized and day three, they signed the civil rights act. Right. Like it was that neat, like, oops, yeah, cool. Not true. You know, it was messy. Right. And so now that this is messy, a lot of people have opinions about the mess. Like, whoa, this is too much. It's out of control. It's all these things. Nothing that comes with change. No change comes without mess. So we need to acknowledge that. Secondly, the civil rights movement was about the mind. There was nothing written about civil rights and the, the needs for Black people to be considered in a very specific way as humans. There was nothing stamped. And so that, that movement was about getting it on paper. It was a mindset movement. This is a heart set movement. The whole world is stopped. And you have no ability to move but to watch this stuff. And your heartstrings are pulled because you're watching a man be murdered on TV. That is the difference to me. We've gone from a mindset to a heart set. To me, the next step is bridging the two. How do we bring them together so we can find some solutions that settle our hearts and stop the crimes of the mind? That's the next step to me. So I, you know, that's where I'm at with this whole thing. But it's not neat. It's not neat and tidy. And my mom is watching. Mom, it's not neat. It's never neat. <laughs> Desi, did you want to chime in at all or? Uh, yeah, I mean, once again, it's hard to follow Libra. So I'm not gonna lie, that ain't no joke. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that I think about uh, constantly is if we hadn't been in COVID and if people hadn't been at home to watch this, would it have just been another, just another black man? an unarmed black man murdered. And so as bad as COVID is, I mean, there is, and I feel bad saying this, this is a positive that's come out of it, is that people were forced to see this and people were like, this happens. And it, it doesn't, it's not just George Floyd. I mean, there are countless, countless, I mean, Emmett Till, I mean, it just goes back and back and back. And so people being stuck at home during COVID and having to see this really opened some folks' eyes. And what I think it did is like it, it made white people realize we can't be quiet anymore. Now, once again, does it stop? You know, is it, is it, you know, I got a t-shirt that says Black Lives Matter. I got, I went to this rally, you know, I got a bumper sticker. I got this. What are you really doing to, to move the movement, to move it forward, you know, to, to end it? Cause it, you know, it, it, Libra, you were, I mean, 
you are so much better at talking about this than I am. But I, I totally, you know, it, it, it does. It, it was a hard thing where people were just like, this is happening. What can I do? And it, it really forced people to realize what's happening to Black folks in this country, what's been happening to Black folks in this country. Thank you, guys. And before we move on to our last topic this evening, uh, I want to talk about uh, the next one of our great sponsors that uh, are helping us show this event, and that is Willamette Falls Studio. Willamette Falls Studio's mission is to inspire lifelong learning, advance knowledge, and define communications through digital media technology to educate and strengthen communities. As public access facility, Willamette Falls provides cities with channel management services. Additionally, they provide services that help to put our community dollars at work. Willamette Falls Studio is production training facility, a host agency for internships and job skill building, and a centralized location with media support for local events. Willamette Falls Studio Participant Network provides a spectrum of opportunities in media production, production management, and content delivery. Their professional staff work daily to create media content for local organizations, capture city projects, consult on productions, customize broadcast systems, and provide technical support. The staff at Willamette Falls work with all levels of experience in media production. Any resident of the five service areas can learn how to be a Willamette Falls studio producer at little to no out-of-pocket cost. All they require is playback of your final project on the public channel. Come in and talk to the staff about how they can help you with your communication needs. Essentially, Willamette Falls Studio provides residents with a porthole into their community through televised local government meetings and community produced programming, coupled, coupled with the training to create and share their views. Residents have a unique opportunity, not only to access the community's global perspective, but to help also shape it. So now I'd like to uh, move on and talk about the importance of uh, unity and bringing together uh, communities. So let's talk about the Milwaukee Bay sit-in for Solidarity. So uh, it, the date is June 9th, 2020, and I know both of you helped uh, to organize or spoke at the Black Lives event at the Milwaukee Bay Park. There were over 500 residents uh, joined the crowd. So could you tell our audience, uh, you know, how did you guys get this thing organized and why was it so successful? Uh, so it, it really, it, it started from seeing everything that was happening here in, in Oregon, in Portland and seeing, you know, the kids in Clackamas, they had their rally and it, it was, you know, well attended. And once again, kids' voices were heard, which is what, which is what it's all about. Like not just amplifying black voices, but amplifying amplifying student voice, which is what we also need in our schools, right? We need when we're making decisions in our schools, we need to make sure that our kids are the ones having a seat at the table as well as the adults, so their voices are heard. And so, seeing that, um, I reached out to some folks. You know, I. I talked to city councilwoman uh, Falconer to ask her, you know, what do you think about this idea? I reached out to, uh, you know, some lifelong Milwaukeeans, uh, the Storms, Gabe and Nikki Storm, and, you know, got them on board. And, you know, it was just, um, it really, I just think people hear kids more, you know, like they, they're more open to hear their story. And I really just wanted kids to talk about their experience here in Oregon, here in North Clackamas, you know, so people can hear what they have to go through. You know, like where I grew up, I had black people in my school. There are kids here in North Clackamas and in Oregon that can, you know, that will, that have been the only black kid in their classroom, right? So when they talk about slavery in class, all the white kids go to the one black kid and say, hey, can you tell us more about that? And it's like, first of all, it's not that kid's job. Second of all, they weren't around. Third of all, you know, how about you reflect on 
why this whole country was set up the way it was to oppress black people, right? And so, you know, I, I just, I, I started reaching out to uh, some folks at the school, you know, Rao, Alder Creek, Milwaukee, Rex Putnam, and started talking to folks there and said, hey, do you have any kids that are willing to speak? And those kids came out and, you know, they did a great job. I mean, they really, I think they opened a lot of people's eyes to what their experiences are like in our schools, you know, being one of two black kids and, you know, never having a black teacher throughout their entire experience. So, I mean, that's where it started for me was just how do we amplify our students' voices here in this community? And then from there, I, I reached out to Libra and then, you know, she said, yep, I'm dope. I'll come do it. <laughs> and, and she showed up, you know, and, and I mean, that, her speech was, was just fantastic. And so, you know, I, I, for me, it's all about community, right? So if everybody feels like they're a part of this community, then we can do things. But if people don't feel like they're a part of the community, you know, nothing gets done and we stay stagnant. We stay right where we are. And we have to make sure that everybody, you know, everybody feels inclusive. Everybody feels like they're a part of this community so we can move forward. We can get things done. But I mean, so that, that's, where, that's where it started with me. And now Libra's gonna take it over and she's gonna drop some knowledge. <laughs> that question is only for Desi because that was Desi's thing. So <laughs> I have nothing to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's really like, I can't imagine what it's like growing up here in Oregon, especially like in Milwaukee, because once again, we, we, we've, we've talked a lot about how white Oregon is. And then, you know, if you're black and you know, you live in Oregon or Portland, I always heard like North Portland, North Portland, that's where all, you know, that's where black people are. Now they're being pushed out to the numbers, right? And so, you know, and, and they're being pushed out to have, you know, ha there are more black folks moving out to Happy Valley as well. So how do we make sure that every voice is heard and not just, not just the same old voices that we hear from every time, every day? You know, like one of my former students, uh, I read her letter and it was really great that she, you know, she felt the confidence to come there, write that letter, even though she didn't want to read it, that, that's, that's okay. She wrote it, she got up there and people heard what she had to say. And that's really, that's really what it was about. Just making sure, kid, being a teacher, and you know, you know, Libra, like Libra said, advocating for kids is what we do. And so that's that's really where it came from. So I, I did see someone asked about uh, the speech that I did that day. So just because it's relevant, I'll answer that. Um, I never know what I'm going to say. I hate to say that like so. <laughs> um, I, my speaking is very, um, it's very, it's a very intimate thing for me. Um, I've learned to accept it as uh, it's, it's, it's a gift for me that I am freely and openly willing to give to anyone willing to listen but it's not something that I prepare or um, like structure in a way that I ever know what it's gonna do. Sometimes it lands flat and it does nothing for people, even though my, my wish is always to walk in a room and to have my words land on one set of ears in a way that improves their ability to have confidence and do what they need to do. I literally say that to myself every time I, before I speak. But that day, um, I just knew I wanted to um, be there for the community, right? And I really felt moved in the moment. And um, and I had, I, I mean, let me correct that. I give myself an outline. So it's not like I show up unprepared. I have an outline. But often when I get there and I talk to people, I'm intentional about talking to people um, and listening to the people that are there and where they are in that moment. Oftentimes my speech can change. 
um, based on what people say to me and what I hear that maybe they need to hear. Um, I'll, I'll make some adjustments, adjustments in the moment to make sure that I can support their needs. Thank you guys. So um, uh, to the general audience, right? So this question is, you know, why should people get involved? And, and, and I heard an interesting theory uh, that somebody brought up and, and they call it, is your local government a vending machine or a barn raiser, right? How do you think about your local government? So if you think that it's a vending machine, you just pay your taxes and you get what you get, right? Or is it a barn raiser where you feel that uh, you know your opinion matters and that you can change um, the aspect uh, of that? So what advice would you give to someone or reason to become active in their community? Uh Unfortunately, for so long, I think the institutions that have been built in this country have made it more, it's made it easier for folks to feel like it's a vending machine type of experience because it seems so um, unattainable for the, the regular person to do things. And then the barriers in um, anyone's life make it even more um, difficult for someone to believe that they can be a part of the change. Um, but I think that sometimes we think about change and political positioning as these big positions that always get advertised and, you know, we're talking about them in general election, but you can be the change in your house. You can be the change in your neighborhood. You can be the change at the school, PTA, just volunteering. I think the key is that if you have a moment to show up, then, and that is what you're moved to do, don't hesitate to do it, just show up. And experience it in however way you can, whatever you're available to do. And in that moment, you might find other opportunities. But the first step is when you get that little feeling in your stomach, like I need to show up because I feel like I can listen to something or hear something or maybe say something that's helpful, show up and you'll figure out where your spacing is and where you belong. I started my advocacy for kids as a PTA treasurer in Hawaii. I had um, a daughter who was afraid of, um, not afraid, sorry, she was allergic to nuts and the school um, decided that they wanted to serve peanut butter. And this was way before now, it's like not an issue, but. Um, and they wanted to take all the kids that had a peanut allergy and sit them on the stage of the lunchroom and let them eat like they had a scarlet letter. And so uh, as at that time, it was a PTA meeting and they needed a treasurer. And they said the executive committee of that PTA team would make a decision on whether that would happen or not. So I had a child at that time that would be impacted. And they didn't have a treasurer. And so I said, well, I know finances. I'll do that job because I wanted, I wanted to say on whether my child was going to sit on a stage and be stared at while she eats non-PETA things. And that's how it began for me. And then I sat there and listened. I was like, oh, my God, there's more work to be done. OK, I'll help out there. Oh, I'll help out there. Oh, I'll help out there. And it just became a thing. Um, but I originally started the thing with just simply saying, I don't want my kids to sit on a stage. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, for the, for the longest time, I never thought of myself as like a leader. You'll hear me, you've heard me say it over and over again. I'm just a fifth grade teacher. You know, I just want to show up, you know, teach my class and then go home but so many times people, not, not so many, I mean, people have just said, hey, does he, you know, you have this thing? I don't know what it is. Maybe you should do it. And for the longest time, I tried not to listen to that. And I think we need to, you know, do that more. Like, you know, let people know you do have this quality. You can make a difference. And you might not know what it is, but there are people around you that can help guide you through and guide you to that. And so that's what I would tell folks, like if you feel it, 
like like Libra was saying, you have to you have to step up and you have to do it. And you know, it's not going to be easy. There are going to be barriers, but you surround yourself with a good support system. You know, you can you can really affect change, and it can, you know. It, it like I like I say, it's a marathon, right? It's not a sprint, but you just have to be able to like believe in yourself and get people that believe in you. Yeah, and so here's my next question, and I'll give you a little bit of my experience. So, um, for it's it's not important the amount of volunteer work that I do uh, with the city and, and how much I believe in the community and and how much that. I feel that I contribute to the community. But I will tell you my, my first time uh, ever going into a public meeting, it was uh, a former mayor and a developer, and they were talking about Main Street Village and parking. And I raised my voice and they both kind of turned around and they kind of yelled at me and tried to shut me down. It wasn't intentional. I mean, it wasn't meant to be mean. I was, it was just opposite of what they wanted, right? Uh, but right, that it took a lot of courage for me, right, to go to that meeting. It took a lot of courage for me to open up my mouth. Uh, and it took a lot of courage for me to go to the next meeting, right, knowing that I might get shouted at. So no matter if you're white, black, uh, purple, orange, uh, red, uh, there is a fear factor, right, of trying to, to get involved. So uh, I know, I'm sure that you guys both have a story about, you know, that first fear, but um, how, how, what kind of advice can you give to overcome, uh, that fear? Well, I go in front of a room full of 25, 10 year olds who do not hold back anything. And that's one thing I've learned is that kids will just tell you straight up how it is. So going in front of a bunch of adults, I think for me, that's easier. Cause when you go up in front of a bunch of kids, they will tell you exactly how they feel. They will tell you. If, you know, if your breath smells, they will tell you, they will be straight up with you. So, you know, the only, the only way to get over it is just, you, you just got to be willing to, you know, like Libra said, sometimes when she speaks, it doesn't land well with, you know, sometimes it falls flat. If it falls flat, it falls flat. You just got to keep going. I think really what it is, is you, once again, you have to believe in yourself and you have to get those people around you that will support you and you know pick you up when you're feeling down and say you know yeah it's hard keep going fight the good fight and you just got it, it, it's support you just can't it's none of this is ever done by by ourselves we have people around us that help us manage this and get through it and take it to the next level so you know you have to have a good support system and yet you just have to believe in yourself and maybe spend some time in front of 10 year olds I like the 10 year old advice. That's a great, because that is a tough, tough crowd. Um, I, I, I agree with everything Desi has said. And I also will add that when you believe in something, the first thing you need to do is think to yourself, why is this important? You know, I think that you need to make sure that your ego is really far behind and that you reflect on the why and that why is like generated in something that is impactful for you and everyone you know, right? So that's the first thing I would say before you even try. Because if you don't have that clarity, it's really easy to, to, to not have success because you're just there for the wrong reasons. And then the next thing I would say is that once you are ready to speak up and use your voice, don't be afraid to do it a couple of times because sometimes your voice is so different from every other voice and they'll try to mute you or they'll try to, you know, lower your, your volume because they're just not ready to hear that. But if you keep saying it, eventually someone else is going to hear and they're going to chime in and then someone else is going to hear and they're going to chime in and eventually it becomes a chorus, but you have to keep, at it. Um, and so the fear is difficult to overcome. And I'm not going to sit there and tell people, you know, this is just easy. It's not. 
but um, if you generate it to the re to your why, and your why is truly from the purest place in your heart, then you will find the energy to keep saying it, and eventually you'll you'll find your own course. So we, we, we've talked about a, a lot about uh, kind of kids. And so we've had some, the, the, some questions about kids. So I, uh, we'll raise those up uh, here right now. So uh, Desi, you, you've brought this up about um, amplifying, right, the voices of the children. So um, what can we do uh, to continue to amplify our kids' voices? I always make sure. Make sure you make space for them. You know, um, I think sometimes we as adults think that we know what's best. And, you know, I'm 40 years old. I've lived, you know, I've done this, I've done that. Yes, you may have done that, but were you listened to when you felt a certain way when you were that age? So, you know, we, we just have to take time to listen and make sure our kids, like like I said, have a seat at the table. When decisions are being made, we have to listen to the kids. You know, I could be in a meeting with a parent about a kid, and I, you know, and you have all these adults talking about the kid, and the kid's sitting right there, and at no point does anybody stop and say, what do you think? How do you feel? You know, and then the decision's made, and then this kid is, like, sitting there, like I'm not being seen, I'm not being heard. So it's just stopping and listening and asking, what do you want? How do you feel? You know, I think I think kids should always be a part of, you know, hiring. You know, like if you're gonna hire a new administrator in a building, everyone should have a seat at the table, even kids, even in elementary school, like, you know, sometimes a kid, you know, in fifth grade or fourth grade can ask that question that, you know, adults would never think of, right? And so we have to make space for our kids to hear how they feel and get that real authenticity because too many times adults come in and they have their egos and they know, you know, they, they think they know when they don't have an idea. So just making space for kids, that's what, that would be my two cents. Yeah, I, uh, we always like to say we don't have a kid problem in America. We have an adult problem because a lot of times we just get in their way. And um, I love the fact that we're amplifying voices in the, the era that we're in. Um, a whole nother subject is, you know, all these terms. We have all these terms now. It's just like, okay, cool. Amplifying voices is a cool thing. I love it. But you can amplify a voice at a very simple level. And I think sometimes parents um, often miss opportunities to teach children to later be amplifiers versus they're not ready now. And that's as simple as you know, allowing them to make a decision that maybe you want to do for them um, or allowing them to acknowledge a decision that they made and helping them see how great of a decision that was so that that muscle became really natural for them. Like, oh, that's what decision making is. Oh, let me do that again because it wasn't so hard. Um, and I think we spend a lot of time on punitive corrections instead of more of a positive affirmation. And we talk a lot about microaggressions in school where, you know, there's, there's also micro affirmations that can happen that are more positive and sometimes they can be used negatively too. But um, I think that those things are the, the small ways to teach a kid how to amplify and you fortify them slowly and then they become, you know, very comfortable with that. As, as adults and as parents, we have to remember that every kid has the potential of doing a lot. And I think sometimes the first thought an adult has when they want to help a kid is, oh, you're going to be the next whatever, instead of allowing them to say, I want to be or I want to go this way. 
And, and so just be careful how you push and also be reflective in how you allow them to see how they can be amplified in their own right. And so I'd be remiss if I did not share um, uh, some of the comments that we're getting. Uh, it looks like that Clackamas County or uh, uh, Clackamas County has a youth action board. Uh, the city of Milwaukee uh, has it in initiated a youth board and they're taking applications. So check the city website and Milwaukee uh, High School has a youth advisory council. So, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, it, it's hard when, when you're younger. There's a lot of things to, that, you know, that you're not quite aware of how important it is in life uh, quite yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to say something, say something. And, and you know, encourage to, you know, part, to participate uh, in programs, something that you enjoy and, 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 and make sure that, you know, that uh, what, you, what you believe in is what you are willing to say and, and uh, how you're going to reach out uh, not only to your, your parents, but also to um, your classmates as well. And so um, uh, here, here's a, so I don't have children. I, I want this to be clear. And so, right, I, I, my life is so separated from school. It is, uh, right, unbelievable, okay? So uh, I find this I find this in, uh, this question interesting. So I, I will tell you a story from my youth, which I didn't actually until about six months ago realize how maybe mentally it kind of changed my my perception of life a little bit. So uh, uh, in the town that I grew up in, you know, it was basically divided by a river, right? More black people lived on one side of the river, and more white people lived on the other side of the river, which is you know to train track, you know, whatever you want to call it. And so one of the high schools closed down on what's the east side, the other side of the, the west side was the white side and the east side was generally the black side. And one of the high schools closed down in, uh, on the east side and they, uh, they decided to make uh, my high school, uh, the high school that the majority of them were gonna go. And this was my senior year. And for the first time in my life, right, I had armed policemen, right, in my school uh, when these, right, on the first opening day, and I could never, ever, right, I didn't understand why. Nobody really ever explained it to anybody. But, right, I think that maybe either there was uh, an element of criminal activity at the old high school, right? But I never thought about it, that the image that it played on me. Um, so, and, and this is where this question kind of uh, comes from, and I don't want to interpret it in any way, but it's just a feeling, right, that I, that I had that I've been thinking about. And so the question is, do you feel our schools are a safe place for uh, your kids? I believe that's for you, Chair, and for Counselor Nicodemus. Uh, how could we as a community make it our schools better serve uh, Black students? And, and along those lines, um, do we want to talk about uh, policing in the school districts, or is that something that we don't want to touch on? I'll leave it up to you. Uh, I'll talk about what uh, I'll start with are schools safe for our Black kids? And from what I hear, I would say no, like we're working towards that. That's something we're working towards. But, you know, it, it, it takes not only just if you're lucky enough to have a black teacher or a teacher of color in your building, it takes white teachers, it takes parents to come in and advocate for kids, you know, because there are kids that go home and tell their parent, oh, you know, like, for example, uh, the, our, my son's barber, she's a woman of color. She hit, she's raising a, 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 a five-year-old on her own. She's got to work. She's got to do this. And a teacher told her that her daughter isn't getting online. And, and if she doesn't, if she continues not to get online and come to class, she's going to call DHS because she's not doing her job as a parent. This parent of color then thinks, well, you know, she's just looking out for my kid. Well, there's 
there's something behind that, right? Is she calling out a white parent that might their kid isn't doing that? So we're we're still a long ways away because you know this parent is thinking that the teacher has their her daughter's best interest in mind. And my first inclination is I don't think so. I think that this parent or this teacher is doing this because you're a person of color and they don't think that you're doing your job as a parent when you're just trying to make, right now during COVID, you are, you know, she's just trying to eke out a living right now. And she's late to work every day because she's trying to make sure that her little one's online. And so are kids safe? No, we have a long way to go to teach all of our white colleagues what racism or bias looks like and how to interrupt that. You know, I, 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 you know, my wife and I were like, we will sit down with you. We will write an email with you to talk to that teacher, to let them know that what they're saying isn't right. And ask all, ask all the right questions. Cause also too, I think, you know, some of our parents don't, you know, they don't know the questions to ask and think about their experiences in school, you know, where they went to segregated schools or they were always in the principal's office, like just raising your hand. Oh, that's a sign of disrespect. You're out. And so they don't have a good experience in school. So therefore they don't, you know, I've had lots of parents come in ready, just ready to go off because they remember what it was like for them when they were in school. And so we have to keep that in mind. You know, it's not, you know, it isn't, it, it's hard being, being in school and being a teacher, it's rocket science, right? And how do we, how do we get it so our, our kids feel safe? And I mean, and that's not even talking about like bringing a gun to school. That's just like trying to survive in a room where a black kid might see themselves on TV and they're constantly criminalized, right? Black skin means you're a criminal. And when you have classmates sitting around you that might might think that same way, only because the media and society has fed them that Im image, that impression, we have to, I mean, right now, I, we would have, I, I wish we could reimagine schools in a whole different way. But right now, like, think about this. Our schools are still the last bastion of colonialism right? The way we operate. And I, I've been in it for 20 years. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a product of it. How can we break those, literally break those chains of this idea of white European school system? How can we change it? You know, getting rid of great, I mean, there's, there's so many things, but in the end, are our kids safe? No. Are we working towards making it safe? Yes. Do we have a long way to go? Hell yes. So. Yeah, well said. I um, I love your story, Greg, about the school, your school experience. And, um, you know, I think parents often forget that 70% of most communities are not, um, adults with school-aged kids in a household. And so oftentimes when you're involved with your kids stuff, you know, you think that the whole world is experiencing it where 70% of your community is not. Um, so that's important for us to recognize. And then your story about security, you know, growing up in New York City, there's, there's metal detectors at the doors when you walk in every high school, um, usually armed um, police officers, several, or at the door and they pat you down when you walk through the door. And the unfortunate part, it wasn't until I left New York that I realized that that was not normal because um, that was my normal, right? And, uh, and I went to a, a con like what was considered a great school. So um, it was interesting to see that other people weren't experiencing that. And then you move fast forward and you learn about SRO, school resource officers and how they are, um, you know, criminalizing our kids in schools and 
they show up, they're in uniform, they park their car at the front, they have, they have weapons and all these things that come with that contract. And what does that mean, right? It's just a, it's an extension of the policing system that is also in deep need of reform. Um, and so when, when Desi talks about uh, the, the school system, He's absolutely right. I mean, it's the last monopoly of our of our universe, and we somehow don't see a need to change it, right? Um, we just feel like if we complain enough about it, if we put enough money into it, more money, more money will help it just correct itself. When the reality is, we're doing all the same things that we did when Black people were slaves, and so why would we assume? that now it's going to work and we're no longer slaves. It's just a very weird equation that we one day are gonna have to face. And COVID to me, as much as people may not like it and they don't agree with everything that's going on and that's a whole nother subject, it's a wonderful opportunity to dismantle the system and recreate it. Um, if we could all just take a deep breath, I think that we could probably come up with at least some solutions, not all, um, and, but it's a great opportunity for us. To, it's the first time that we're not doing what we've always done. And so looking at that and trying to take that opportunity would be wonderful for all kids. And then the last question you had was, are our kids safe? No, they're not safe. Um, I think uh, kids of color are definitely not safe, but I'm gonna tell you, no kids are safe. Because at some point, you have to realize that when you have a system that needs to be reformed, connecting with a system that needs to be reformed. So policing and education have now connected two systems that need to be reformed. And in the middle there, you have children. Um, no kid is safe. None. So even though it may seem as though only a few are being impacted by it, it impacts every kid. Vicarious trauma is a real thing. If you are watching children be arrested in the middle of a school, um, be attacked because of the color of their skin in the middle of school, and your kid may not have the same color or the same opportunity to be um, disproportionately approached in that way, but they're watching it, vicarious trauma is a real thing. So uh, like I always say, if you think this is not your problem, it is, because it comes to your door in one form or another. So we all need to speak up because all the children are affected. And I also will say this, that no matter what your politics are, we've had some serious um, leaders in our country over the years that have done good and have done bad. Every single one of them were in a school at some time. Every single one of them was a child at one time. And every single one of them at one time, someone said, it's not my problem until they become our president. It's your problem. So today is the day that we all have to stand up for all of these issues use and know that it, it may not affect you today, but it darn sure will affect you one day. Thank you guys. And, and uh, before we uh, say goodbye, uh, I want to just talk about our last sponsor this evening, which is the Facebook group Milwaukee Chit Chat 97222 and 97267. Sick and tired of looking at Facebook posts that do not relate to your community or are just hateful? Please join Milwaukee Chit Chat 97222 and 97267. The site offers advice, businesses, events, and friends seeking advice in our local area with a positive and friendly atmosphere. Need a local plumber, roofer, or landscaper? Go to Milwaukee Chit Chat. Have a business or an event you want to promote? Go to Milwaukee Chit Chat. Looking for a mentor, announcements, or to offer help? Go to Milwaukee Chit Chat. With over 7,000 members, your message, your idea, your question, your advice will be heard. I know I look at it every day, and when you join, you will too. So I want to I want to thank you guys both uh, for being here tonight, and uh, I'm going to uh, close the uh, program with. Uh, uh, a personal opinion, and then of course another commercial because I like doing commercials. But I, I gotta—I I really want to tell you, I—I I, I met Chair Ford uh, in a in naming the Happy Valley New Schools, and uh, I've had the pleasure of, of working with Council uh, Councilor Nicodemus uh, very shortly here in this short little 
time of office. And I'm so proud of both of you guys. You guys, you're a great voice uh, for all of the community. I mean, you guys are wonderful people and it has been a pleasure to, to get to know you a little bit more, Counselor. And Chair, I look forward to many happy days with you. So thank you guys so much for being here tonight. And uh, it is truly a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Libra. Thank you, guys. Great, great commercials. I love them. <laughs> yes, they're fabulous. <laughs> now, if I just figure out how to get to my, well, maybe we won't do my, in my opinion, because I can't seem to figure out how my screen works. So, Scott, why don't we go ahead and just go to the last slide here? So I am so excited because March 3rd, we're going to have a great celebration, continuation of the Letting Library Lecture Series. It is going to feature Milwaukee City Councilor Lisa Beatty, 2017 Volunteer of the Year, Lisa Gunyan Riker, House District 41 Rep, Corinne Powers, former Mayor and former House District Rep, Carolyn Tomei, Raging Granny, Sharon Wampler, and our good friend here at the museum, uh, Linda Carr, will be hosting it. It's going to be the same format that you had tonight. It's going to be available on the same channels. So it's going to be 6.30, March 3rd. And we look so forward to everybody coming and visiting. Um, they are going to just discuss uh, issues of uh, women have uh, today, uh, their political and uh, the accomplishments, what they think about their forerunners, kind of in a Milwaukee or The View, the TV show, The View kind of format. So once again, thank you all for the city of Milwaukee for uh, joining us tonight. And we look forward all season long to be doing these lecture series. And thank you again to our guests. So good night, everybody.